You Are Special by Max Lucado. The Wemmings were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of golden star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the streets, all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Others, though, could do little. They got dots. Punchinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then, when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him one for no reason at all. He doesn't, he deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. The few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks, who had a lot of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he met a Wemmick who was unlike any he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I wanna be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the wood carver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Well, why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear. 
So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. And he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes grew wide at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch up on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello? The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little Wemmick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wemmicks just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are pretty special. Punchinello laughed. <laughs> Me? Special? Why? I can't walk fast. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day, I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly. Because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as the Wemmick walked out the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. Good morning, church. 
Our call to worship today comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. It's question one, uh, and if you, if this is something you have memorized, I invite you to say it along with me. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see.
Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Will you pray with me? Lord, you are good. As you were with the Israelites in the wilderness, you are with us today. We are tired, but we praise you. We delight in you. Your presence sustains us. You see us. You care about us. You love us. You even like us. With the old spiritual, we pray, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Like Isaiah, in your presence, we find that we are unclean. And we are part of an unclean people. Take our sin. We can't handle it alone. Take our hidden selfishness that creates systems that harm the vulnerable, that deploys words that hurt those that we love, and creates mistrust of you. Take our lives and redirect us. Save us from a safe life and lead us in a full, abundant life. We are thankful for your grace, that you don't give up on us. We are grateful for all that you do for us. Make us into a people of gratitude. We are thankful for the gifts you give us, for food and for laughter, for salvation, for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would meet us in a special way this week. For those that need jobs, we ask for jobs. We lift up parents and kids as they think about going back to school in such a stressful time. We lift up teachers and administrators to you. We pray for our country that is in such turmoil. We pray for black and indigenous communities that they would know full embracement, while also being able to hold on to the beautiful cultural identities from which they come. In these few moments, we lift up the people that are on our hearts to you. Lord, we lift up our lives to your care. We love you. Amen.
Hi. I didn't see you there. Well, uh, you surprised me, but come. Come get closer to the fire. You know what else surprises me? When I think about the Songs of Ascent. Why don't I hear more about them now that I live in the Pacific Northwest? I wonder how many of you all have tried reading the Psalms of Ascent while hiking. Maybe Steve or Matt or Alyssa or Nancy. If we were all together in person, I might ask for a show of hands. How many of y'all have tried to embody the spirit of the this, this psalm while hiking? My understanding of these psalms is that the tradition they are attributed to is going up to the festival in Jerusalem from the surrounding lowlands. So, you know, if we did an analog in Washington, maybe imagine Jerusalem was Ellensburg and we were all hiking up there to go to the rodeo. So a time of preparation and anticipation, possibly some boredom and education. You learn a lot about the plants and animals along the way, uh, the roads and towns, maybe rehearse a little history. So actually, not all that different from right now. Boredom, education, preparation, anticipation. The more I consider what it would have been like to be on the road to Jerusalem, the more I wonder if it wasn't too dissimilar from this current experience. While we're all full of emotion that is valid from day to day, we are also doing a lot of reflection, a lot of prognosticating. We're asking ourselves, how did I get here? Why am I in this town? Why am I in this job? Why am I in this family? Why am I in this country? I think our identity has been so questioned to the core that we aren't really sure what our story is and where it's going. To some extent, there's always a segment of our community that is in this sort of worldview altering transition or crisis, a uh, loss of a job or a parent, uh, an unfortunate health diagnosis, some of us that have had moments of story dislocation where we are rewriting and revising our story or coming to a new understanding of it. But I would also dare to suggest that the folks in Sanctuary enjoy a little bit of insulation, various privileges that keep us from the really heart-wrenching dislocation that we hear about in the news. Even when fire destroyed the green bean, Greenwood in Seattle hummed on. Even when we lost members of our community, our congregation and families, life continued. It back, beckoned us back into normality. We had the privilege to take breaks from our grief and indulge in blissful ignorance at restaurants, or maybe hang out with friends or family who could help us escape what we were going through at the time. But recently, it's been different. We've all been living in a time of unprecedented captivity. One that has been really felt the world over, though it has proven more costly to the poor and disadvantaged for sure. And while we've all faced adversity in different ways and at different times, it hasn't necessarily looked like police brutality for the color of our skin or our socioeconomic status, or having our homes and businesses destroyed by war. Still, this pandemic is unprecedented in the captivity for most of us, and we're witnessing how fragile our lives and our livelihoods are. So how do we relocate our story? How do we send our roots into the ground to re-anchor and re-establish solid ground when things feel so shaky? I think you could see where I'm going with this. It's a simple story reframe. I'm leaving my hometown, I'm going to Jerusalem, and on the way, I'm gonna tell the story of what God has done and is doing in my life. My life is defined by and set within the life of the people, of my people. Therefore, my story is the story of God's people. Now, the story that would have been rehearsed, at least one of the main stories that identified the people of Israel, 
is, of course, our other lesson from the Old Testament, that of the oppression and rescue from Pharaoh. It is a story that is still rehearsed by the Jewish community as the main identity and story-forming event of the Jewish people and their faith, and we share that with them. Same with Isaiah, uh, the other passage from today for the lectionary, which retells the story of the people of Israel from even further back, rehearsing the story of God's covenant and faithfulness to Abraham and Sarah. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. It's almost like the psalmist is imagining what it was like to be Pharaoh's army and getting consumed by the sea, rather than the way it actually happened, where the Israelites were not Pharaoh's army consumed by the sea. They were got through on dry land. The enemies in these stories were in the form of infertility and insecurity, in the form of being persecuted as slaves and as a minority ethnic group that was too quickly becoming a majority for their slave masters. Let me say that again. Insecurity in the form of infertility and insecurity in the form of being persecuted as a minority ethnic group that was too quickly becoming a majority in the society. It sounds to me like two pretty contemporary issues that people are afraid of. And uh, maybe ought to be, maybe not. Yet God was and has been faithful and present. If that is our past, if that's the story we rehearse, what's, what's the present? What's going on right now? Well, we kind of covered that, didn't we? Um, our present is journey. Our present is marching forward reciting our past, constantly fashioning and refashioning our identity. We come from a story that probably by all respects should have been snuffed out uh, multiple times. We come from a story where we recognize our very breath as gift. We come from a story of slavery, infertility, landlessness, assault. But our journey means putting on God-colored glasses and seeing the world through God's eyes. We ought to be looking for the unexpected, the marginalized, the manger, the prophet, the alien, the orphan, and the widow. In the fall of 2019, James K. A. Smith came to SPU to talk about why Christians that set out to change the culture ended up being changed by the culture instead. Simply put, he blamed liturgies. Christians didn't practice liturgies that reinforce a biblical view justice, love, and creation care. We've been lulled into a consumeristic culture that does not value what God values. So then we look to the future to know what these God-colored glasses are pointing us to. What is the point of knowing where we have been and where we are if we don't know where we're going? In the case of Psalm 124, we're headed to Jerusalem. In the case of scripture, we're headed to New Jerusalem. And the key to all those journeys, the micro and the macro, the reason Jerusalem figures so heavily in the geography of our faith is Christ. Yep, Jesus. In the terms of Psalm 124, we get what seems an obvious allusion to the person of Christ as told by John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the word was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through the word, and, and apart from the word, not one thing that came into being that has come into being. No doubt John would have known of, and perhaps even sung, the last line of Psalm 124, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And what is that help? That help is that the Savior broke the snare. Now, I'd love to tell you that the broken snare means our enemies have no power anymore. But clearly, we still suffer from injustice. Clearly, on the regular, we feel enslaved. We feel cheated, robbed by both people and systems that are unjust. 
But since the snare is broken, all of this in one sense is quite easy to dismiss. Uh, I'll give you a, an example. Thieves stole my bike, my dad's bike, actually, from me. It's one I had rebuilt and maintained. And it had a lot of sentimental value. But one thing I can say is they haven't stolen Christ from me. Now, let's go to a less tri trivial uh, example. Uh, perverted systems of justice have stolen so much from uh, our BIPOC friends, but those systems can't abscond with Christ either. We may be uncomfortable as we adjust to new norms of policing or helping our neighbors experiencing homelessness or job loss, but Christ has not been stolen from you. Christ has not been stolen from me. Christ has not been stolen from us, and Christ has not been stolen from from even the people who oppress us. This is because the snare is broken. The good news, as unfair as it sounds, is that even our neighbors who do evil or those who run the systems that victimize so many, even they are not bound to destruction. Repentance is always a breath away by claiming a new Lord, the Lord of heaven and earth. If even those who do evil with malice and intent and ignore the laws of God, if even they can be saved, how much more so you who cultivates a relationship with God and justice and love of neighbor and who calls in on Sunday morning for Zoom, even though you've been Zooming all week? We've escaped the snare because our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Rehearse this story as you ascend to Jerusalem, the promised city of rest and presence of God. Rehearse this story as you take this, uh, as you live through this time of elections and sickness and division one day at a time, rehearse this story as you pray for your enemies and for the reconciliation of unjust systems. Stay grounded in your identity that captures freedom from slavery, that captures new land from wandering, that captures new birth from infertility, and that captures resurrection from the in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
May you discover all your gifts and give them generously. May you listen.